This is part two of the lecture on angiosperms. Our theme here is work smarter, not harder. In this one, we're going to look at flower anatomy and then look at flowers in general. How do we describe those flowers um, for when you do want to go into plant taxonomy? What sort of traits will you need to know? So first, we'll look at flower anatomy. And we can break flowers up into four different whorls. So let's say we have our stem leading up to the flower here. This is called the peduncle, which is a very fun word. At the top of that stem, there is a structure or a region more, more likely where all of the floral whorls attach. That is called the receptacle. And then we have a series of four whorls that are contained within each other. Think of like concentric circles. And I'm gonna kind of blow those out from each other. So your outermost whorl is composed of sepals. And as a whorl, all together, we call it the calyx. So the calyx is composed of multiple sepals. Within that whorl, we might see structures that look similar to the sepals, different from the sepals. It depends on the type of flower. These are the petals. And as a whorl, they are called the corolla. Together, the corolla and the calyx are called the perianth. Just inside of the petals, you have another whorl. This is composed of structures called stamens. And the whorl is called the andresium, which means house of man. So this is where pollen is produced. And then within that, you have another whorl of carpels. You might also see these called pistils. That just depends on um, kind of how you're looking at it. And the whorl is called the gynecium. So that's house of woman. And the position of these whorls is all important because the stamens might be petal-like. Um, the carpels might also look petal-like. Um, the petals and the sepals can often look identical to each other. Sometimes one of these whorls is missing. It's all about where they are. So you're going to count those whorls. And knowing whether something is um, petals or sepals when one of those whorls is missing isn't necessarily something that you could figure out intuitively. Um, that's just something we know from their sort of developmental pathways. So you're not going to define whether something is a sepal based on it being small and green. You're going to define that something is a sepal because it's at the outermost whorl. So position is all important just like when we defined whether something was a branch or um, a leaf because of where they were. So that holds true with our flower anatomy as well. Within the andresium and the gynesium, we have some um, specific uh, anatomical parts we should talk about. So we'll make some little sepals out here. Then we'll make some big petals out here, oh, beautiful petals. They're very even. We have some good perspective here. And our receptacle where they're all attaching, which is at the top of the peduncle. So we have our calyx on the outside and our corolla just inside that. So I've drawn the perianth so far. So now we need to draw andresium just inside that. So this whole structure is called a stamen. The top of the stamen is composed of the microsporangia. So these are these sort of elongate sporangia that produce pollen, and we call these the anthers. And they sit on top of a structure called a filament. Those two things together make up the stamen. 
carpal. has three different components. At the top of the carpal is the stigma. This is where pollen is delivered to. Here we have the style. And the pollen tube has to grow all the way down the style. So let's say we have our little pollen grain land here. It's not going to have wings because we're not in the gymnosperms. I always want to draw pollen with little wings. It's going to grow that tube all the way down the style, down into the ovary, where the egg is. That is our ovule. So fertilization will happen when that pollen tube can grow all the way down the style. Sometimes the style is quite short. Sometimes, as with corn, the corn silk, it's very long. Um, and so the um, sperm will swim down that tube or be transported down that tube because they don't have flagella and then end up at the ovule. And that is our floral anatomy. Here's a little review of those different components. So we have our calyx that's made up of sepals outermost whorl. Our corolla is made up of petals. Together we call that the perianth. Perianth. Peri means around and anth means flower. So this is like the going around the flower, right? The outside of the flower. Our andresium is composed of stamens and our gynesium is composed of carpels. Okay, and so we have all of our different components of those uh, more complex parts over here. So now we have to think about flowers versus inflorescences. I'm going to talk about flowers in this video, and we'll look at inflorescences in the next one. So when thinking about a single flower, we have to consider the symmetry. You can't really do this with an inflorescence, so um, don't try to extend this into the inflorescence category. When you look at inflorescences and symmetry, it's of the individual florets, so the smaller kind of flowers that make up the larger inflorescence. That's where you would look at the symmetry of the flowers. So in each of these, you're looking at either a single flower or a single floret. You also need to count the number of parts in each whorl and the position of the ovary. So for symmetry, we can think of flowers as having either radial or bilateral symmetry. And you might see this at, written as actinomorphic and zygomorphic. They're interchangeable terms, but just in case you see that in a key somewhere. So when you think of radial symmetry, you are thinking multiple lines of symmetry. So in this flower on the left here, we can draw lines across the flower where either side is the same, um, where we have four petals on each side. And no matter how we um, kind of look at it, if we draw a line through the middle, um, we're going to have that same symmetry on each side. Unlike this Calypso orchid over here, where we only have one line of symmetry, much like us, where we could draw a line kind of straight down us, and we're relatively the same on either side. It doesn't have to be identical, but virtually the same. But I couldn't draw one this way, or this way, or this way, and say the same thing. So we have radial symmetry, where we have many lines of symmetry, and then we have bilateral symmetry, where there's just one line of symmetry where we can draw and have the same on either side. So here we can look at these and consider what the symmetry is. So for this one, we'll start just straight up and down. On either side, they're approximately the same. If I were to try to draw that line of symmetry here, I would have this big structure on this side of the line and it wouldn't be here, right? So there isn't a second line of symmetry that I can draw, regardless of how I try to draw it we're always going to have this structure kind of throwing it off. It's not in the middle and this weird petal here. On this one, similar story, right? I can draw that line and I have the same approximate shape on either side, but going this way or this way, it's a little bit different for what's on each side. I would only have two petals on one side and three on the other. So both of these have a bilateral or a zygomorphic symmetry.
unlike these, which each have radial symmetry. We can draw a line of symmetry for each of these through a petal and into a gap. So we have multiple lines of symmetry on this radial one over here. And then on this one, we can do the same. We can go through each petal and have the same thing come out on either side. And this particular flower, this iris, is one of those interesting ones where it's that location of the structures that will tell you what they are. I am pretty sure these are the sepals, these are the petals, these are the stamens. No, stamens are, I got it. Stamens are within here. You can't see them, they're tucked in. And then this is the carpal. Here you can see the style, the stigma is sticking out just on the bottom there, and then the, op, or the ovary would be at the bottom. So all about where they are. It's the innermost whorl, so it's the gynecium. So then we can count the number of parts in each whorl. So here for this ranunculus, we have five sepals. So the calyx would be five. If we count the petals, one, two, three, four, five, next whorl in. Okay, so then we get to the stamens. How am I gonna count these? So if there's 10 or more, it's just many. And then if they're again for the gynecium, so this is, you're kind of in your male phase here where they're producing pollen, and then they kind of go into a female phase where they're gonna receive pollen, and here they've um, made their fruits already. So these are the sort of, um, fruits that have um, evolved from those carpels. But again, there's many, there's more than 10. So whenever you're looking um, for your plant ID, you would want to be able to count those because they're gonna tell you um, potentially what family or group of plants um, you're looking at, but they will also tell you whether it is a monocot or a eudicot. This five number tells us that, and a lot of other features as well, but that this particular plant is likely a eudicot because eudicots make their floral parts in fours and fives. So you might have four or eight or five or 10, whereas our monocots tend to make them in threes. So you might have three or six or nine of each. When things get really complicated is when you start looking at fusion. So here we have a gynecium in all four of these little images that has three carpels. So the number would be three. However, we have either unfused free carpels in A, or we have three sets of different types of fusion in B, C, and D. Here, the ovaries are fused. but we have the styles and the stigma free. Here we have ovaries and styles are fused. And then the stigmas are free, or at least uh, maybe the styles partially free. Here we see our fused stigma. And this is a really common situation where all of the carpels are fused together. And the only way you can count them is by taking a cross section through that ovary and counting the number of components or compartments, I should say, um, which we're going to call locules or the number of nodes or little nodules kind of on that stigma. So we'll see this condition quite a lot and you have to count um, those different compartments and fusion. So here's an example of, I think this is a lily. So we're looking at the lily carpal. And if we look at the stigma, we can see three main components, right? And then if we were to slice through um, this ovary down here, we would also see three main components. So there we go. We have three fused ovaries here and each of these is an ovule and they exist within um, these compartments called locules. Another important feature for identification is the position of the ovary with respect to the other flower parts. So in all of our drawings, we have drawn the ovary on top of all of those other flower parts. 
And that's what you're seeing here in this first one. So the ovary is superior to the other flower parts. We would call this a hypogynous flower because hypo under gynous or for the gynesium, right? So it's hypogynous because it has a superior ovary. So this is kind of almost counterintuitive, but it makes perfect sense. So if the ovary is superior and on top, that means that the flower is hypogynous, right? So the rest of the flower is under the gynesium. So hypogynous. So when you're talking about this top layer of words here, of terms, this relates to the flower. Nope. Refers to flower. While this lower layer refers to the gynesium. So these terms are always paired. Hypogenous flowers will have a superior ovary. On the other side of things, an epigenous flower will have an inferior ovary. So epigenous, epigynous, epigynesium. It's on top of the gynesium. So the ovary is located below the rest of the flower. So the flower is epigenous. It's on top of the gynesium. But the ovary is inferior. It is below the rest of the flower. So these are terms that refer with respect to each other, and they sound like they would go with the opposite one. Um, you just gotta think about it logically. The weird one is here in the middle, perigenous. So peri means around. So the flower is sort of forming around the gynesium. So this is a weird situation. We see it in the rose family, which is a huge family, and a few other groups. Um, so all of the floral whorls except the gynesium fuse together before they get to the receptacle and form one solid structure. And this is called a hypanthium. And when we look at roses, um, that's what forms a rose hip, which you might think of as the fruit of the rose, um, right? So it's a, that's formed from the hypanthium. And that's a perigenous flower with a semi-inferior ovary because it's sort of below the flower, but it still fuses with the receptacle where all of the rest of the parts do. So thinking about epigenous flowers, here we have our petals and our sepals and our stamens are fusing kind of at the base of the style and the ovary is located below. So the ovary is going to kind of fuse with the receptacle, but nothing else is. So this is an epigenous flower because all of the rest of the flor floral whorls are on top of the ovary and the ovary is inferior. In a real flower, what that looks like is this. We have this kind of rounded structure here and this will swell up once fertilization occurs and it starts to make a fruit. So we have this inferior ovary. All of the rest of the floral parts have fused together. So we also have a hypanthium. And then we start to see them break out into sepals, petals, and stamens. But they've all fused together and still made this hypanthium. And then that fuses together still above where the ovary is. It doesn't go just around the ovary. Here we can see an example of a hypogenous flower with a superior ovary. Our big beautiful ovary is here sitting on top of all of the rest of the flower parts, which you can see fused together underneath it. So the receptacle would be right here. Here's our peduncle. And here's our confusing situation where you have a semi-inferior ovary where the floral parts have fused together up here and then they form this hypanthium but that still goes underneath the ovary. So the ovary sort of sits on top of the hypanthium. It doesn't fuse together above that point, right? With the ovary underneath, it goes around it. Now I've made it really hard to look at. It goes around the ovary and fuses underneath it. So all the floral parts still fuse at the receptacle, 
but this ovary isn't really superior it's, superior, it's sort of hidden within the floral structure because we have this hypanthium that's formed.